So I would like you to ask me to. I would like to ask you to help me welcome Emery. So I want to thank uh, Muriel and Andrea for inviting me to the program committee. This is certainly you know, quite an opportunity for me to tell you about the work that we've been doing on trying to understand how the brain represents uh, information. This is an area that I got into formally a little, about 12 years or so ago. And so I'm going to give you some overview of what it is we've been up to. Um, you know, I do a small fraction of the work. I have the good fortune to work with many very, very good colleagues. And I've just listed them here. Um, because it's their work primarily that I'm going to be talking about. The experiments that I'm going to be talking about are ones which are done primarily by Lauren Frank and, and Matt Wilson. And the modeling work is done by Ricardo, Lauren, Corey Eden, David Nguyen. And my algorithm collaborations have been with Victor Solo, whom I think some of you, you know. And uh, David, Ricardo, and Lauren are responsible for the, uh, for the animations that I'm going to show. So this is the outline that I want to follow. I want to tell you a little bit about sort of brain signals, and I'll make that explicit in a moment. Then I'm going to hone in on one specific type of brain signals. I'm going to talk specifically about neural spike trains and trying to develop good ways to get information to try to get understand how the brain is using spikes to transmit and represent the things that uh, the brain has to do. And I'm going to use two examples to illustrate that. That is. Representing, an ensemble, representing something in the ensemble of neural spiking activity. And then the second thing I'm going to talk about is what's called neuroplasticity, or the way in which neurons change the way they represent information. Then I'll just have a few summary comments. All right. So the two main points that I want to make are the following. I want to emphasize how this point process framework can be used to represent neural spike trains. And in particular, I'm going to show you just a little how just a very modicum, some very elementary kind of state space ideas can be used to look at dynamics in, uh, in neural systems. All right, so this is kind of the state of the world in some sense. Um, there is a lot of work which is done, has been done in neuroscience for a long time on theory, because we've known about Hodgkin and Huxley equations for a long time. And ideally, if the world is working perfectly, then your theory or abstract ideas may lead to design of experiments. Then if the experiment is well designed, you just sort of look at the data, and then you figure out whether or not your idea was correct and your theory was reasonable, and you proceed. So you know, ideally, we have this loop. But what's happening now in brain science is one thing in particular. The ways in which we collect information are many. Neurophysiological experiments, functional magnetic resonance imaging, EEG, magnetoencephalography, cognitive, cognitive experience, experiments, and behavioral experiments. And the types of data that are being collected are vast. Not only that, one of the key features, and I think one of the things that attracts, certainly attracts me, and I think attracts many of the people in neuroscience to neuroscience itself, is that the problems are dynamic, and the data and the problems are multivariate. And just to contrast that just for a second with genomics and what's called bioinformatics, where you have high dimensional data, but for the most part, you're looking at a static system. So right here from the start, you know, one of the main themes I'm going to be talking about is the importance of dynamics and trying to get dynamic methods into our thinking about looking at neuroscience data. Because unfortunately, this is the case, that most of the data analysis techniques in neuroscience right now turn out to be rather static. Right? So let me just begin by just reviewing a little bit of basic physiology, because this is going to be kind of the cornerstones of what I'm going to talk about. And then we'll move on to there to an ex an ex a specific experimental system, which is going to be the, the, the hippocampus. So these are illustrations of neurons. So these are nerve cells in the body. And we're going to talk primarily about nerve cells in the brain. And there are three main parts, the dendrite, the cell body, and the axon. And just to remind you, the dendrites actually receive information, like they make contact with the neuron up here, and an electrical impulse is transmitted down the cell body, and then actually induces the release of a neurotransmitter here, which usually diffuses across a very short distance and then either excites or inhibits the next cell. And that's how these neural signals are transmitted. That's like kind of one of the basic paradigms. And what I, the reason I put this up here, this is from Kendall, Schwartz, and Jessel, a very standard textbook in neuroscience, is just to illustrate the various shapes of, you know, sort of, you know, neurons. 
This is a spinal motor neuron. This over here is a hippocampal foraminal cells. These are sorts of neurons we're going to be talking about in just a second. But very, very, but that's kind of the, that's the classic thinking. Let me just quickly state what's a bit of the reality. So each neuron is really a multiple dynamic, is, is a multiple dynamical system. It's a dynamic, they're dynamical systems at many levels. And I just want to go through these points really quickly just to have you appreciate it, just have you realize that I'm going to talk about just one component of this dynamical system, one component of this information transmission. So look, the dendrites, they're not static entities. They're constantly extending and retracting, and they change based on the information or how the, what sort of uh, information or how they've been excited by the neuron um, which is synapsing on them up here. As we know, gene regulation is very important for controlling how the neurotransmitters down here are essentially synthesized. And a very important area of research in neuroscience is what's called synaptic plasticity. In the sense we talk, we look, we notice how the synapses, which are the connections from one neuron onto the next, how they're constantly changing with experience. Now, I mentioned to you that we have currents which basically flow down the cell body, and right here you have what's called the axon sheath, which is basically a protein that envelops the neuron to make sure, to, to ensure the fidelity. It's like insulation, ensure the fidelity of the current transmission. But the way that the neurons communicate are many-fold. I talked about the action potential propagating down this way. We now know that there are action potentials that go back up the cell body. And then the dendritic currents, which flow because many, there's a lot of charge separation and we have currents sort of in the extracellular environment, are one sort of basic idea as to where we think the EEG may be coming from. And then if you look here, and this is not a very good example of it, but I just put it here because it's important to state. Another way in which neurons communicate with each other is through electrotonic coupling, just like you transmit uh, essentially heartbeats across the heart muscle. And we, we start to realize now that this might be quite important for very fast transmission of certain effects and might have an important role in the origin of certain types of seizures. So having said all that, I'm going to ignore this, this, that, 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 that. And I'm going to talk about you know, this sort of information transmission, the information transmission in the spikes. So imagine if each one of these guys is, has at least this level of dynamics in it, and you put a lot of these guys together, you can understand why you can represent a lot of things with something like, you know, a brain, when you think you have something like 10 to the 10 of these guys working for you. All right, so now, let me get down to sort of the basics of a neuroscience experiment. And I've picked this example because it illustrates a, a, very, a very common paradigm in neuroscience. So, on some level, the design of neuroscience experiments is pretty straightforward. I mean, and I say that in terms of the way the experiment is set up. They're technically very challenging, but conceptually they're straightforward. And this is illustrated by this example I've taken from Fred Rieke's book, Spikes. And um, Fred works with Bill Bialik and, uh, and Rob von Royer von Stefanich. And they have done a number of experiments in what's called the FLY H1 system. So the FLY has a pair of neurons in its eye, which is sensitive to the motion or velocity of an object moving in its visual field. So as the object moves back and forth, it induces with a certain velocity, it induces this neuron to spike. So these are these spikes, these electrical discharges here. And so this is one guy spiking, this is the other guy spiking. So this is 500 milliseconds of time, zero to 500 milliseconds, and this is a wind signal that was flashed in front of this fly, and here are the neural spikes, that, the spikes that came out as a consequence. So one of the things that, so in some sense, these spikes are telling this fly that this is the wind signal that came through there. And so one of the games we're going to play in uh, sort of next is, if I had enough neurons like this, could I deduce that that was the signal that actually caused this uh, spiking activity here? And that's what we're going to call the decoding problem. But I say this to illustrate the fact that the paradigm, the neuroscience experiment, the straightforward part that I'm talking about is that you put in a signal and you measure the response, and a lot of what is happening in neuroscience right now is trying to understand how can you characterize the relationship between a stimulus and the, the response and a stimulus that you think is relevant? All right. So the way we're going to go about this is in terms of point processes. So just the definition. So point processes being binary 0, 1 processes that occur in continuous time. And these are examples 
of point processes that you know many of you are far more familiar with than, than I am, right? And again, just to sort of set up the framework, this is going to be sort of a state-based framework in which we're going to have some observations, which are going to be our point process, and we're going to have a state model for something evolving in time, and we're going to look to design some filter algorithms, which are going to, we're going to use the data to make some best estimate of the signal based on this incoming stream of data, where the incoming stream of data in this case is going to be the, the spiking activity, the point process. All right? And we're going to do two calculations to carry this out. We're going to do some sort of recursive Gaussian approximation to a posterior density, sort of use this recursive form of Bayes' rule, or we're going to generate an instantaneous steep descent algorithm. So that, that's kind of the setup. All right, so let's get down to the neurophysiology. So just one other little technical point that I just need to make here. So this is another illustration of a spike train. This is 30 seconds of time, 6 seconds, 12, 18, 24, down to 30. This is coming from one neuron. This is actually from a retinal neuron. And the reason I put it out here is just to show you that one of the things that we're going to do is we're going to look at time sort of discreetly. We're going to pretend that we can break time up into very small time intervals on the order of a millisecond or so, such that at any one point in time, there's only going to be one event in a bend here. And the reason to do that is that now, essentially the problem of looking at spikes is just the problem of estimating the right Bernoulli probability of getting a spike in this bend here, maybe given some history. So this discretization, so we're going to work with discretized likelihoods, if you would, in this formulation. All right, and so to do this, I'm going to define this conditional intensity function, which again, I'm sure most of you are very, very familiar with. And it's just the idea of, it's this, it's, we're going to define it as the limit, as this delta goes to zero, of the probability of a spike in a small time interval, conditional on the history, divided by this small time interval, and it's going to give us a rate. And if we have delta be small, then this is going to give us this kind of conditional probability that we'd like to have, the probability of seeing a spike here now, given the history that up until now. And this is obviously a, a generalization of the notion of a Poisson rate function, because obviously for Poisson processes, there's no, there's no sort of history dependence. We're going to need this because of the biophysics of a neuron. The history is going to be important. All right, now, so let's move to some some neurophysiology and some anatomy. So the part of the brain that I'm going to talk about is the rat hippocampus. So the hippocampus is a brain region which is important for forming memories. And we just learned this only about 60 years ago through some experiments of nature. There's a very well-known patient in neuroscience called HM. He was a kid who, when he was about nine years old, had a bike accident, fell off, hit his head, about a year later developed intractable seizures. So they were so bad that by the age, he didn't finish college until he was 21. When he was 27, this surgeon in Hartford by the name of John Scoville offered him the possibility of having an operation to try to rectify these seizures, because these were very, very debilitating. What happened was, um, Scoville went in and he took out this part of uh, um, HM's medial temporal lobe, so it's the part of the brain which sits here, this is the medial aspect, and the temporal lobe is sort of this, this, this side of the, head, the brain here. As a consequence, he was able to, the seizure stopped, but what they saw immediately was that he was able to form no new memories. So what would happen is you would meet him and you'd say, hi HM, how are you doing? Hi Henry, Henry Brown, good to meet you, good to meet you. Stop, wait 45 seconds, come back, and he had no memory of what had just transpired. Everything is intact from what had transpired prior to the operation. Remembers his family, remembers everything. But as a consequence of that, we realize that this brain region, the hippocampus, which is in the medial temporal lobe, is responsible for helping us form new memories. Well, one of the things that we've come to realize, is, so we've looked at ways to try to study that in animal systems. And one of the most productive animal models for looking at the hippocampus is the rat hippocampus. And I'll tell you exactly why in just a second. But this is just a little bit of anatomy here. So if you lift off the cortex here, see what happens is in the, in, in the rat, because the rat has less cortex, the cortex in the human has sort of folded over and under like this here. So the hippocampus actually sits sort of more on the, on the inferior aspect of the medial temporal lobe of humans. Here, in the, in the rats, it's sort of more of a superior structure. So you can just kind of lift off the back of this rat's head, sort of look under there. And here's the structure that I'm talking about. 
And it's a real neural network. Information comes in through what's called the interrhinal cortex, the dentate gyrus C83. These are just regions of the hippocampus. And we're going to talk about recordings which come from here, the C81 region. All right, then there's an outflow track through the layers five and six of the interrhinal cortex. Now, so here is the biology that's going to drive everything that I'm going to talk about henceforth. And it's the type of properties of the receptive fields of rat hippocampal neurons, rat hippocampal pyramidal neurons. And this is an illustration of it. So this is an experiment that Lauren did about six or seven years ago in which he had a rat so you place a, this is, a, this is a, a, a track in which you place a food well here and you place a food well there. And you train a rat to run back and forth like this. Okay, so he's running back and forth. And every time you get some food, runs back, get some food, so forth. And so this is an illustration of that experiment. So this is time in seconds. And what I've done here is I've stretched out the track. So the track here is 300 centimeters in length. Okay? And the animal is running back and forth, back and forth like this. Now, what we've done is, we're recording from, this is a recording from actually multiple neurons, but I'm showing the spiking activity coming from one single neuron. And this rat is running through here like this, and this neuron spikes it. Bop, 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 bop. Turns back around, goes back to the same physical space. He's traversing the same region here between about 75 centimeters and 125 centimeters, and it doesn't spike. So it's like this, he's walking this way. Bop, 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 bop walks out of that region, turns around, walks back this way, doesn't spike, turns around, walks back, bang, bop, 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 bop. So this neuron is a place neuron. It's actually saying, I'm telling you when the animal is in this position of the environment. So, and you can see it's fairly, it's fairly precise. I and mean, we didn't doctor the slide or anything. This is like real data. So you can see him going back and forth. And notice not only is it telling you something about where he is in space, it's also telling you something about which direction he's heading. So this is the place field phenomenon. It was discovered by John O'Keefe, you know, sort of more than, you know, 30-some years ago. So this is a model for memory formation in, in the rats. Now, as soon as I tell you that this is a, that this is a brain region that's important for memory formation, you, certainly short-term memory formation, you it has to be extremely flexible. So as soon as you change the environment where you give the animal a different task, you expect these fields to be able to reform, and they have to reform fairly quickly. So I'm going to give you another illustration of it here. So this is, this is a, now a circular environment, not a linear environment. And there's a, I think we're running here. There we go. So the animal is running around this environment. So this is, this is about 60 centimeters in diameter. There is here a... Um, there's a barrier about 30 centimeters high coming out of you, coming out of the plane of the board. And there's a white cue card sitting here so that when the animal comes in to do this experiment, it can orient the same way every time. All right? And now, as the animal runs around, and as I'll show you in a second, we have multiple electrodes in this hippocampal region here. We're recording the spiking activity of many neurons. And I'm just illustrating three here. So you can see, we put a dot on the page every time that one, one specific neuron fires. So there is a green neuron that's firing here that's demarcating this, excuse me, this region of space. There's a white neuron here which is demarcating that region of space. And there's a red neuron up there demarcating the region up, up here. So these are these place fields. We change the environment and now the fields form differently. So not, not surprising, all right? So the sort of thing that we're gonna look at is Suppose we have more than three. Suppose we have an order of 30. How well can we triangulate, or how well does this group of neurons represent where this animal is? How well can we extract that information from the spiking activity of these neurons? All right? So this is one thing, again, to give you some sense of what is going on in neuroscience now. What has enabled these sorts of investigations in the last several years is the advent of these technologies that allow us to record for many neurons simultaneously. This is a setup that Matt uses there at MIT. It's a collection of tetrodes, so a collection of four group, excuse me, groups of four electrodes. That's what each one of those little things looks like a tooth with a cavity in it right there is. Right there, right there, right there. And this is kind of the experimental setup that they use. The animal has a head stage here. These are diodes, right? And what these are is these give the position of the animal and so you can record the spiking activity at the same time you're getting the position of the animal. These are emitting light, and you know, the camera is sitting above it, 
and you can record position of the animal while you get the spiking activity. And I just put this over here because this is another illustration of another array which is developed by Richard Norman out at uh, Utah. And it looks like a Fakir bed. It's a 10 by 10 array. And you can see what the size of it is now. And these have actually, this last thread array here, have now been implanted in humans. And you know, there was this big report which came out last year in Science done by John Donahue's group at Brown where they actually showed that with this array recorded from a gentleman who's actually, actually tetraplegic, in other words, who has no use of his, his uh, body sort of below his neck, he's able to use it and think and move a computer cursor on the screen. Right? So this is the technology that's enabled these sorts of experiments. So what we want to look at now is I'm recording many neurons. I have this stimulus, which is the animal moving around. I want to characterize the receptive fields of these neurons. That's going to be the encoding problem. And then what I want to do is look to see if I have enough neurons and I know something about the receptive fields, can I make a statement about where the animal is in its environment you know, using these neurons? And that's going to be the decoding problem. Right? So setting it up very simply, I want to estimate the relationship between spikes and positions. That's what I said. Neuroscience experiments conceptually are sort of straightforward. Now this is just some technical details just to develop the models. I'm going to model the, the fields for the moment. First is sort of like a Gaussian shape, and then I'm going to model them using Zernike polynomials. So let me just illustrate that. So this is, a, and I'm going to talk about the circular environment. So this is just to represent the field as kind of a Gaussian surface. And the reason we did this, you know, several years ago was that people told us that place fields were Gaussian, so we just made a simple Gaussian model. X of t is the animal's position at some time, mu is the center of the field, and sigma is the scale matrix, which just sort of changes the shape of the Gaussian, and e to the alpha basically is going to be the height of the field. When the animal's in the center of the field, you're going to have the maximal height. So you just get a Gaussian surface centered here at this location is what that would amount to. So you estimate these parameters and you can characterize the field for each neuron. Here's another representation using Zernike polynomials. And none of this is motivated by anything sort of biological per se. It's just looking at the data and seeing what the shapes of the fields are. And so to the extent that the fields aren't necessarily perfectly Gaussian, just using a set of basis function, in this case the Zernike polynomials, which is, as you know, are orthogonal polynomials on the disk, we just came up with another way of representing the fields. And again, if you estimate these parameters here, so these are the first nine, the first nine non-zero ones, essentially, you know, and then adding in a DC term, essentially. So, in this experiment, what happens is the animal runs around in this environment, there are two of them, and they run for 23 and 25 minutes. And the way you make them run around is you toss chocolate pellets, actually, chocolate fruit loops. And they, they move and you, and you keep them going. You'd be surprised how good the guys are at making this happen. But it's key because if they're not moving, you won't see the spiking activity that I'm talking about. And they're recording position information at 30 frames a second. And they're recording from roughly, well, from this experiment, we're able to get about 30 neurons from both animals. So we're going to take the first part of the data, about the first 13 or 15 minutes, and estimate the properties of the fields. And this is a very straightforward maximum likelihood estimation problem because I wrote down a likelihood, I formulated a parametric likelihood in terms of this conditional intensity function. There's technically no history in this particular case here. And I just estimate the parameters of the Gaussian or the Zernike, which is what the theta here represents, and I analyze the data. So these are the fits. So this is animal one, that's animal two. So these are the 34 neurons from one animal, these are the 32 neurons from the other animal, and these are essentially their place fields. Okay? So if you look at them, this is cell one under the Gaussian model. This is cell two under the Zernike model. And actually, so just to own up right from the start, the way this is actually estimated here, I mean, obviously, how could you get a shape like this if you're talking about something which is a Gaussian surface? Well, what you do is you let the center of the field possibly be out here so that you can actually model the fact that, the, that most of the activity is there. Right? So that's one of the downsides of using the Gaussian model. Whereas with the Zernike, because it's constrained to be, in other words, it's just using orthogonal polynomials, which are restricted to this area, you, and you have a basis function, which is a set of basis functions sufficiently rich, you can just capture the structure. But anyway, roughly speaking, the fields are represented essentially the same between the two models. 
And what we're going to look at is what impact that these representations have on our ability to decode. Now, we can do a whole sort of discussion on just the, the analysis of the encoding, but I'm going to save that to the end because I want to talk about the dynamics of that. So just give me this for a second. Now, if I have those, then what I want to do is use Bayes' rule to just invert this question and say, can I estimate position you know, given spiking activity? So this is straightforward because we have an observation model, which I wrote down. It's just the joint distribution over all this spiking activity, the probability of spiking for neuron C given the animal's position. I can assume a very simple state space model. I've represented this as some sort of first order AR process, but let's just make it a random walk, make this an, make this an identity. And if I have the parameters of the fields for each, for each neuron, then just this is a very straightforward plug-in to the chapman kamogorov bayes relationship. There's my likelihood. I've made some assumption about the state space model, first order autoregression or, or random walk. And then it's a turn the crank, essentially, because we just plug into this expression. So it's just a question of how do you evaluate this? And as I said, the way we go about evaluating this is just using a Gaussian approximation. So if you just say, let me calculate recursively the posterior mode of this expression here. Okay? Let me calculate the posterior mode of this expression. Then it turns out it has this very simple form. The posterior mode at time k, given the data up to time k, is the one-step prediction plus some weighting thing, plus a set of terms that looks like this. And I've written it in this form on purpose just to illustrate the parallel between this and like a Kalman filter calculation. Because if you look right here, what you're doing is, remember we made the time bends very small, such that this is either a one or a zero. And what you're comparing this with is the probability of getting a spike. So this is the expected value. This is the estimated expected value of this quantity here. And so it means that these numbers here just run between zero and one. So it's like a binary analog, if you would, of sort of like a, a Kalman filter. So if you have a spike and you didn't expect it, then this is going to be roughly 1. And if you didn't get a spike and the probability of spike was high, this is going to be minus 1. So this is how this binary information is being translated into an update of the animal's position. And similarly, you can have an update equation for the covariance or the variance, if you would, so you have a mean and a covariance matrix, so that's your recursive Gaussian approximation. So let me just show you how this works. It's, it's probably easier to look at than to sort of describe. So, so here's an illustration of it. Let's read you all the calculations here real quick. So let me just turn this off. Let me turn this off, too. All right. So, so that's our rat. That's actually about the size of his head. Okay. And over here, you're going to see sort of the neurons. And this is time in seconds. So that last digit there is basically seconds. And so let's just uh, start this. So you can see what the experiment looks like. So, so these, are the, these are the data that are coming in the experiment. So this is the animal moving around. And basically, as long as he's moving, the neurons are spiking. Right. So, that, so that gives you some idea of what the experiment is like. So, so let, me, let me just restart this again. Okay. So now here is, so this is doing the Gaussian estimation, or so it's using the Gaussian representation of the place fields. So this thing here is like that estimator. So that's the mean and that's the confidence ellipse. And this is a 95% confidence ellipse, and if it were working perfectly, it should be intersecting his body 95% of the time. And if you can see, the rat is doing its best to sort of run away from it. So, for, I mean, it's, it's, the estimator's lagging him, basically, right? So, but, but nevertheless, it's sort of roughly in the, the region where he is. And, and if you look here, so this is kind of a running tally of the coverage probability. Of, you know, if this thing were working the way it should, this would be like around 95%. You can see it's hovering around about 27, 26%. Okay. All right, so, so, so that, was, that was an algorithm we sort of started with. So let me just take that guy off. So we'll just we'll let him start again. And so here's the one based on the Zernike model. So all we did here is we just changed the fields, changed the representation of the fields. And so here's this algorithm. 
So the same sort of thing. Same neurons, same spiking activity, different field model. And this is sort of the running tally of the coverage probability. I mean, it's still not at 95%, but it gives you some sense of maybe a bit, you know, a bit sort of better performance. And this, you know, as you can see, it blew up there. It's just sort of this nonlinear thing because it's, it's not as linear as I sort of wrote it there in sort of the representation. So, so, so what's happening here? I mean, this goes on for 10 minutes. So we, we won't dwell on that. But here, so let's just go back here. And so what I was just showing you was this ability, this algorithm to track this. And so, you know, um, and people have asked me, particularly in neuroscience, you know, why are you obsessing about this the same way? Um, or this way, because, uh, you know, linear algorithms work quite well. And in fact, so what's the state of the art in, like, neuroscience presently? So for this sort of analysis, the state of the art is to just generate a simple linear filter, just generate a simple linear regression. Because look, you have, some, you have spiking activity, you have a variable that you want to use to relate it, and so you can regress one on the other, and then you generate some sort of linear filter. Now you get new data, you run the linear filter through the data, and then you make a prediction based on it. And so they said, well, you know, can you show me that this makes some sort of improvement? So this is just an illustration to, to, to sort of show that. So the blue line here, if you look, this is the animal, this is where the animal actually runs. So it starts here, runs there, uh, so actually it's run this way, and then ends up down here, oh, then picks up, continues. So this is 60 seconds of the animal running. And the blue line is the same in both cases. That's the actual animal's actual position. And the red line is what you know, we've been estimating with one of our filters. Not even sort of the best version of it. It's actually the earlier version that I just showed you. And then this is what happens if you use one of these sort of linear filters. Basically, the error that you get is on the order of about 30 centimeters or so. And with this model here, with this simple Gaussian version, the error is about 7.7 .7 meters. This is the, the median error. And so, I mean, it's very apparent, it was very apparent to me, but if you look at these papers that I'll tell you about in a second or so, this is the type of algorithm that's basically being used to, to sort of do this type of analysis in, in neuroscience. So what I've just shown you here is that if you have about 30, 30 neurons, you can estimate an animal's position with an accuracy of about seven centimeters in the case of the Gau eight centimeters in the case of the Gaussian model. And it turns out it's about six centimeters, the median error here. Whereas this sort of reverse correlation, that's just sort of the way regression is called in neuroscience, it's about 30 centimeters. And the coverage probabilities are about 40% or you know, 35%, maybe 70%. So what this is just designed to illustrate is there is this dynamic representation of the animal's position of being maintained in the hippocampus. All right. So that's all well and good. Where, what, sort of, what might be a, a very important practical application of this? Well, I've alluded to this already. You know, there's a lot of interest now in neural prostheses, and there's a lot of papers which have been published um, in the last several years giving illustrations of where you capture neural signals from a brain region, usually in an animal, and most recently in a human, and then you run them through an algorithm, and then you generate a control signal which goes to some sort of prosthetic device like a computer coast cursor or a robot arm. So this is a very, very active area of research, and the idea is that this could be a way of helping restore function to patients that have some sort of damage, let's say here at the spinal cord, when, let's say, the areas which might generate the signals, like in this case, what I've indicated here is this practice uh, area called the uh, parietal reach region, or over here, like primary motor cortex is still intact. So very active area, and our argument is, is that algorithms something like this, or that have this more dynamic spirit of what should be used, is typically not what's, what, what, what's done. All right? So the key point, the neural systems are dynamic, and they constantly change how they represent information. So this is what I want to show you now. So this goes back to something that I did you know, a few years ago with uh, Victor Solo and, uh, and Matt Wilson. And it came out of the following sort of observation. Now, the experiments that I showed you initially, the animal has been in that environment for three days. So the recordings that we took was when the animal was very familiar with the environment. So the issue, and so even when an animal is very familiar with the environment, if you look at the fields as the animal runs back and forth, 
they actually change over time. And this is an illustration of that. This was something that was predicted by work done by um, Larry Abbott at Columbia. He's now at Columbia. He was at Brandeis at the time. And Ken Blum, who was uh, his graduate student. And Mayank Mehta, who's at Brown now, has done a lot of theoretical work, experimental work, to sort of suggest why this might be the case also. But this is an illustration, just a simple cartoon. The animal's running back and forth. The rat's running back and forth. This is where the field is on the first pass, in this location. Then after multiple passes, by the time, it's, by the, time the, uh, the animal finishes running, the field has evolved. It's no longer just sitting here. So let me just show you. This is a more typical sort of data experiment to illustrate that point. So again, a, a, an experiment where a rat is running back and forth on a linear track, and we stretch the track out here. And you can see that the behavior is a little more erratic here. Like, see, he runs down here, turns around, goes partly up the track, turns around, and then runs back, and now runs up here. But again, you can see that this is a single hippocampal neuron. It's actually firing when the animal's moving in this direction here, moving in the up direction. There are no spikes in the down direction. But if you look at how the spiking, where the spiking is occurring, it's evolving in time. It's not just staying right here, but it's actually moving, and the field is actually spreading out. So this is one of these third days, the animal's in the environment. So even when the animal's familiar with the environment, the neuron is changing how it responds essentially to the same stimulus. All right? So the first thing we wanted to do was just say, can we just build a simple algorithm to track it? So using this idea that fields should be Gaussian, one-dimensional Gaussians, we just made a simple one-dimensional Gaussian. So it has three parameters, a height, a scale, a center. And essentially, if I can tell you how these parameters change over time as a function of the spiking activity, I can track the field. So, but setting this up kind of formally, just for the sake of showing the consistency of the, the paradigm we've been using, there's technically an observation model, which I've written here is just this sort of, again, local Bernoulli model. And the state space model here is trivially the, this simple, uh, deterministic update, theta k is equal to theta k minus 1. And we have a time varying parameter which we're estimating, which is three-dimensional. And there's a covariate which goes along with it, which is the animal's position in the environment. So you run, you, you know, you can write down a steepest descent algorithm for it. This was the purpose of that paper back in 2001 to essentially show this. You could write down a steepest descent algorithm for a bind, essentially a point process. So theta k is theta k minus 1. There's a learning rate parameter. There's something involving like the log of the log lambda and delta. And again, here's this error signal again, which is kind of like this innovations term that you get from a common filter. Right? So let me just illustrate this idea here real quick. Because the point that I want to make is to show you how we actually use it to try to answer a neuroscience question. So so, so this is that experiment here. Let me just slow it down. It's so anxious to be seen. It wants to go before I even tell it it can. Let's say slow down. It speeds up. So this is the track going this way. Each one of these is 10 centimeters. All right? This is 10 hertz, 20 hertz, 30 hertz. All right? So this is the data. You're seeing the animal run through the environment. The little dot there is the animal running back and forth. And it's sped up a little bit. The second digit here, just before the decimal, the first digit here before, uh, after the, before the decimal point is actually seconds. So he's running back and forth. And you can see the spiking activity occurring. And you can see the field growing over time. So this is actually 20 minutes, which we've just sort of gone through very quickly. And it's done. So the field started down here. And by the end of the experiment, it's basically up there. So w w what does that mean? Why, why do we care about that? All right. So here's kind of the punchline. Actually, let me just do one thing before I just want to close this one. Here's sort of the punchline. In the first analysis that I did, I took a large amount of data and I estimated the field which I basically made to be static. So here is the static field here in black that I would have had for these data. And so this is like the analog of what I did for all 30-some neurons in the first experiment. 
In actuality, even there, the neurons are evolving their representation. So if you see, initially the neuron was representing the field as here, five minutes in, 10 minutes in, 15 minutes in, it's actually here. By the end of the experiment, this is how it's encoding the spatial information, how it's representing the spatial information, how it's responding to the stimulus of the animal's movement, if you would. So clearly, if you're only using, if you're using this average, you're not accurately representing what the brain is doing. All right, so this is just an illustration of that point. So how have we used these algorithms to try to actually answer a question as opposed to just carry out exercises? Well, we've done a series of studies in which we've looked at the question of how to hip how do receptive fields in the hippocampus form, right? So here's an experiment that Lauren designed to actually look at that question. So this is what's called an eight-arm maze. So an animal learns to start here, run out here, run back here, run out here, run back here, and only after it learns to complete all three sort of oh, see, out, in, out, in, and back does it get a reward. Right? So you train the animal up on this. And then after a time, you block off one of the arms. And there's a little bit of a, a, a picture typo here. There should be this food should be moved over here now. You block off one of the arms in case you block off the seven arm. And now you have the animal run in here. And now it has to run out here and now run back here. So relative to this environment here is new. It's never seen this here in the novel exposure. Everything else is the same. And the question is, what happens to the spiking activity out here? How does it form? What, 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 what happens? Does it just appear? Does it come up gradually? We don't know. So that was the question that Lauren wanted to try to answer. So this just shows you how the experiment is done. It takes several days to actually do it. So on the first day, see, just, to, just to make one sort of statement here. See, the way these experiments are typically done on a given day, you actually, basically, you wake the animal up in the morning and say, look, I want you to exercise. See, so they'd rather sleep during the day. So you say, look, I know you're asleep, but I want you to get up. I want you to run. So he's asleep, so he'll naturally sleep. Then he runs, and as soon as you leave him alone, he'll go back to sleep again. And then he'll run again, and he'll go back to sleep. So that's why you can get sleep, run, sleep. All right? So now, what happens is, on the first few days, what you do is you train him up, and you have him 1, 1, 3, 7. That's what this is. That's familiar. And then, after he's learned this, then you have him do one, three, six. And you might do that for two days or three days. And then you have him do one, three, four. So you only change one arm, basically, at a time, right? And you never change the, the middle arm. That's the way Lauren did the experiment. So here's an illustration of like neural activity from an experiment like this. So look at this. This is coming in, coming in, right? Coming in this way, coming in. Uh, going out there and then coming in. And essentially, you see very little spiking activity happening here in this, in this sort of familiar arm, in this, in this experiment. Now, in this experiment, what they did was block off this arm and open up the arm down here and say, okay, I need you to run in here, run back. Now, run down here and run back. And if you look, you can see that there's spiking activity both when the animal is running out and there's spiking activity both as the animals run in, all right, in both directions. So now, right there, that's different from what happened when the animal was in an environment that it knew, because when it knew the environment, the neuron, at least the ones I showed you anyway, only spiked when the animal was moving in one direction. And this is just a static shot. So the question is, how did this form? What, what are the dynamics that underlie this? So, what Lauren did was he made a very simple model. He just made a simple embellishment to like this, what was in essence a Poisson-like model that we use up until now, where spiking is a function of position and maybe some dynamic parameter, and put in a temporal component. So this is just to illustrate a spline that has a spatial component and a spline multiplied by a component that's temporal. And the temporal pieces are quite interpretable, just to tell you quickly. This represents the propensity of the animal to burst. This, so this is actually estimated from the data. This isn't just a sort of drawn <coughs> configuration. And this actually corresponds to an oscillation, which is very well known in the hippocampus, called the theta rhythm. So you have a position effect, a spatial effect, if you would, and two very well known temporal effects here. Right. So if you plug this into 
one of these learning algorithms or adaptive filters, you can say, let me track the evolution of the field by tracking these parameters, where now these parameters are the spatial control points of the splines. This is much more high dimensional, so there's like about 60 parameters that's being tracked over time. And this epsilon here is no longer just a parameter, but it's just basically a diagonal matrix here. Right? And we can talk about how we you know, got the values for it. Right? So let me, just, let me just show you this, um, how this works here. So before I start it, let me just orient you. So this is, this up here is roughly 10, 20, 30 hertz. The green is going to be the animal's movement outward on the new arm, the dark green. And the light green is going to be the animal's movement on the, on the inward movement on the new arm. So outward movement dark, inward movement light. Orange here is going to be outward movement on the middle part. Yellow is going to be inward movement on the, on the middle part. This is the temporal component here that I just showed you. And so this is the track, which is now 100, well, this, this is 150 centimeters that he's basically covering. All right? So the little dot there is going to be our mouse. Excuse me, our rat. Forgive me, rat. Rats get really offended because we <laughs> call them a mouse. All right, so it's moving along. So these are seconds here. It's sped up. So that's 60 seconds. All this has gone by and nothing has happened from a spiking standpoint. All right, so, so now, now, now you start to see the field first form forming on both parts, all right? And it's roughly about the same size on both parts. Not any spiking activity. And the temporal component actually changes a little bit, but not as much, all right? So they're roughly about the same size. Now they're becoming slightly asymmetric. In other words, you're getting a little more spiking activity when the animal comes in as opposed to going out, all right? So it's asymmetry. So, and it's, it's actually decreasing on the inner arm relative to sort of the the outer outgoing direction relative to the ingoing direction. And now it's, it's preferentially spiking now, going just coming in as opposed to going out more so. Right. So let's, let's just look at that. So these are some stills taken from, from some very similar experiments. So look, there's the track going from 0 to 150 centimeters. And you can see, like in this case here, the animal makes about five passes before any spiking activity starts. All right? Here's another illustration. Same thing. The animal makes multiple passes before any spiking activity starts. And then you see the same sort of behavior, that is, if you look at the field, the field is basically evolving. I mean, this was the part that was very, very surprising to us. I mean, we, we, we I, well, I don't know what we expected, but I guess what we sort of anticipated was you'd sort of see this kind of gradual firing, just sort of increasing. But if you think about this in terms of like the neuron communicating with itself, somehow some sort of threshold of activity or experience has to be crossed before it's actually manifest in this neuron actually responding to the environment and actually discharging spikes. And that's what we, that's what we sort of see, saw here. Now, there was also the other case. We did see some neurons which increased gradually, and there were some neurons who actually decreased their spiking activity. But essentially, 40% of the neurons showed this type of behavior. So the thing which we could actually say is that these place fields can develop after very little or no previous spiking is actually manifest. So we did a little analysis just to try to understand how useful the model was to represent the data. And so this is just the Kolmogorov smirnov test constructed off the time rescaling theorem. Basically, if your conditional intensity function is right, you rescale the times, you get IID exponential random variables, which you can plot as a Kolmogorov smirnov test to determine whether or not the model is useful. So if you look here, actually, I'm sorry, I'm going to back up. If you look here, so here's the Here's the Kolmogorov-Smirnov test. Just comparing the model with the temporal component, OK? 
okay? And the model without the temporal component. And this is the, the way it's set up here is if the model is working perfectly, it should, the plot should lie along the 45 degree line. So when we don't have the temporal component, we get a coma gross smirnoff test looks like this. When we have it, it looks more like this. So to what extent did this work? So the data that I showed you came from the CA1 region of the hippocampus, all right? So we never really got a good fit within the 95% confidence bounds without the temporal component. When we added it, we got it in about 40% of the cases for the CA1 region data. And compared to the deep interrhinal cortex, which I didn't show you these data, but there's, it's the brain region, which is sort of just downstream from the hippocampus, 4% without it and 45% with it. So adding the temporal component, no surprise, you know, actually helps you explain the structure of the data better. So what I've just shown you is this individual plasticity in the CA1 region can actually form pretty rapidly. Now, it turns out that you have to have a minimum of about five minutes or essentially three days of stable experience for this, rep for this representation to become stable. But what's really interesting is that even though the neurons themselves, or this neurons, are seemingly indicating that they're familiar with this environment, the animal's behavior after a time, after the same amount of time, still doesn't say it's familiar with the environment. And what do I mean by that? When you look at the running velocity of the animal, so running velocity is often an indicator of how well the animal knows the environment. He runs faster as soon as he knows what he's doing. The neurons in the hippocampus are saying, we've got it. You know, we, are represent we feel pretty comfortable representing space. But the other neurons, which govern, help to govern its behavior, are saying, well, we're not going to let you run quite fast because we're not quite sure of the environment. So, so it's really interesting. So one brain region seemingly has it, but the animal overall doesn't seemingly have it. So that, that's what we kind of learned from this, from this experiment. So having said that, just some conclusions. So I've shown you just some work about looking at single neurons and ensembles of neurons doing these learning and memory experiments. And the thing that I tried to give you some sense of, I took one component of the nervous system, one signal that comes out, an important signal, and shown you that it can be represented as a, as a dynamic high dimensional point process. And I just mentioned the stakes-based paradigm because, I, I mean, for me, I think it's very, very important because it, it really makes explicit this link between this data analysis and a lot of deterministic modeling that's been done in neuroscience for a number of years. And if I say, what kind of things do we need in neuroscience, I think we, we clearly need greater involvement of quantitative scientists. There's no question about that. You know, the data deluge which is occurring in neuroscience, I think, far exceeds that, which you see in areas of genomics and bioinformatics. And in particular, as I said at the outset, the data are dynamic. So it, it naturally requires you know, a level of thinking that just doesn't come from sort of static model building or static method construction. So hence, the greater push for developing methods which are appropriate for the experiments for the specific data. And, and for me, for the moment, sort of more emphasis on empiricism at the moment. The theory will come, but the, the, we, we're getting a very small look at the nervous system even now, even though we're getting a better look. And if we just do a little more empiricism, a little less theory for the moment, I think we'll be better off. So I'm just going to stop there. Thank you. So when I showed you the diagram of the animals, uh, so, so, so I think the, the fair way to say it is if you stick your electrode in the CA1 region and you're getting out pyramidal neurons, then the, the activity of the pyramidal neurons pretty much seems to be place specific. All of them won't be place specific and the estimate is roughly about 30% probably participate in, in, in some sort of like spatial encoding exercise like I just showed you. I, I guess I was asking that Perhaps uh, in terms of the delay in spiking when you, uh, right. is it because uh, input from some sensory neurons has to build up to a critical level before you 
Oh, oh, in the last part there. Oh, oh in the last thing I showed you. Yeah. I mean, that, that's a that's a very very good question. So I mean, so now that that's kind of our, that's kind of our uh, task is to figure that out. So, so for example, um, so let's just go back downstream. Let's go two regions in the hippocampus downstream, uh, uh, upstream. So in the dentate gyrus, what we found is this is some data that Matt hasn't published yet, but David Newen did these experiments. You find neurons there that form fields just for a time. They, they, they sort of form them and they hold and they kind of disappear. So they're evanescent. And so it may be exactly along the lines that you're suggesting and where that sort of formation is taking place and what has to be the robust signal that actually pushes it over the threshold, we, we certainly don't know. But the phenomenon I'm showing you is, is pretty reliably there. And, and may I ask one more? Okay. And, and the it appeared in the two rats, the spatial encoding had nothing to do with the specific identity of the neurons. So somehow, neuron one might be encoding a completely different region. So how is the mapping back to space? How is the rat running those algorithms that you have for tracking its position or? If, if, if I knew that, we'd be having this discussion in Stockholm. What this is just designed to sort of show you is that that information is basically there. I mean, and and so the, you know, you know, that I mean, that's really sort of the sixty-four thousand dollar question. You know, how is it happening? We don't know. But at least now, this, see, this gives us a target to go after, and the target wasn't there as clear before. I think that's sort of a fair statement. Andrea. So my question is, what can information theorists do for you? Uh, you say less theory here, but uh, if you could charge the people in this room, what's missing on the theory side? Do you need new tools? Do you need uh, better ways of interpreting the information? Yeah, I, I think there's something very important that you guys can do for us. So right now, there is a lot of use of information theory, and I've avoided it. I mean, information theory in neuroscience data analysis. Okay. And what it has amounted to is just taking something like out of the pages of, you know, Cover and Thomas and applying it very blindly in many respects to these sorts of data. There are two things that are immediately out of it, and that's the point that I wanted to make. First of all, the systems are dynamic. They're evolving. And, you know, you could say the word non-stationary, but it's beyond non-stationary. They're, they're dynamic, all right? So just applying a simple algorithm and calculating the mutual information is not meaningful. That point hasn't caught on in neuroscience. I mean, as simple and as obvious as it is here, probably to this crowd, that's not obvious to a lot of my colleagues in neuroscience. So helping me make that message would be very, just that would be very useful. Now, having said that, you know, the cool questions I think come about after you start, in other words, the, excuse me, we need more methods to do these sorts of dynamic things. So there, there's some very straightforward problems. Doing multiple neurons simultaneously, estimating joint distributions, doing these sorts of things. How do you do that the right way? Joint distributions between continuous signals. You know, I've shown you just point process signals, but you can get out the field potentials and essentially the spike trains at the same time. You know, totally untouched, you know, problem, you know, to be done, to be done properly. And then in other areas, you know, these are extremely high dimensional. You know, how do you actually solve these extremely high dimensional inverse problems? So, so thinking specifically about the one with the prosthetics. So you stick your electrodes in, you're recording these neural signals, and you know, the neurons actually fade in and out. And but yet you want to continue to drive the prosthetic for the patient every day. You know, basically, how do you how do you do that? How can you reliably guarantee you're going to have signal? So there are tons of questions like that. But, but I think that you know, the, the key part is to get involved in the experiment, you know, working directly with the question. And then I think you know, the, the, the sort of the kind of the overarching idea is the superstructure, will, it'll form itself, right? I think coming in with just kind of paradigms a priori and sort of saying, oh, this is how the brain must work, must work it, it, it's not going to help. I think it's going to misguide us, if anything. So, so that, that's kind of some of the things. And, and I have another longer list, which I can give you offline, too. We'll post it on the website. Okay. After I write my grants and get the fun. Um, so at some point, uh, at some point, uh, you approximate and you just say, take the uh, identity matrix in the place of the 
arbitrary stochastic mass matrix I believe. Uh, you know, if you're doing inference and learning, I believe that you would have to sometimes go back to some more complicated situation. And you are, uh, say, 100 neurons, you probably have to consider many more in different regions. Right. And, uh, um, there's also a the time-space uh, paradigm, right? And, uh, and so, uh, so they have to all different regions of different interactions. So in some sense, you know, you are going to start the evolution theory process of uh, multiple models and other things, right? It's going to get much more complicated. And, and I hope so. And I, and, I, and I think that's exactly the mantle, you know. So appropriately taking up that mantle is exactly the sort of thing that I think, you know, people should be doing. I mean, th this, I mean, this should just be taken as just an illustration. Just take a simple representation. Use a modicum of biology. The only biology that I use with these neurons have place receptive fields. And the dynamic model itself is trivial. In fact, it's just, it's a random walk state space model. And it turns out that it tells you the information representation that is being maintained there is actually fairly substantial. So I, I, I think that, you know, I, I agree. And I think that the only thing that I would add to that is just let the embellishments of those sorts of models be guided by the neuroscience and not by the, you know, the plethora of techniques which we can bring to bear on this. So in other words, if you gave me this as a data analysis question and said, conduct, you know, predict this animal's position the best way you possibly could, I mean, you know, we could knock that out and get his position down to one centimeter or something like that without any trouble. But it's not clear that, that would help me understand the biology that much better. So that, that, that would be my only admonition. Hi. Um, I had a curiosity how much the measurement disturbs the phenomenon itself after seeing the electrodes taken to the head of the rat. Yeah. I, mean, that, that, I mean, so, um, so that, I mean, that's a, that's a, that's a very, very good question. I mean, and that what, what you can actually see is that if you, um, so, you record after a few days, after the animal's had a chance to recover. So you can see that you're reliably getting, getting activity you know, from the neurons. But if you don't do the surgeries very well, you can actually, you know, you won't be able to record quite well. I mean, I, I can tell you more in detail of it, maybe offline. Well, to, to stay on schedule, uh, we will now uh, uh, 